Yeah, let's let's start with a, a sort of basic breakdown. Rundown. A sort of basic, yes, a sort of basic rundown, as basic as you can get, but I don't want to make it so basic that it doesn't um, account for anything. I think sometimes we can take our theories or models, make them too basic, and then they account for very little. And so it's a sort of basic rundown, but I want to make sure that we're all kind of speaking the same vernacular when we get to questions. So the basic theory makes sense. Um, okay, so here's the deal. Um, whenever we're talking about anything in behavior analysis, the story starts and kind of ends at this idea of stimulus function. So stimuli in your environment elicit or evoke behavior. And the goal of the behavior analyst is to figure out what is doing that. Um, and when the behavior is problematic, how to change it. And so Skinner showed up and he said, hey, we can make this neutral stimulus, whatever it is, evoke whatever behavior we select. And so we can call it, for example, a discriminative stimulus. It you know, makes the pigeon turn in circles or the pigeon peck a disc. And you know, he showed some cool stuff, like pigeons can discriminate colors, they can discriminate words, images, and so on. Um, all of that maintained by reinforcement. In the context of pigeons, positive reinforcement. So if it picks the correct color, it gets a reward. Um, and so on. And that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. But then from this kind of basic model, this basic idea, um, you get the emergence of the field of applied behavior analysis. It's the same claim. We can make this discriminative stimulus, whatever it is, maybe it's a social behavior, maybe it's an academic um, problem, uh, maybe it's something that previously evoked challenging behavior. We can make this stimulus evoke whatever behavior we select. Ideally, it's some sort of learning, and so oftentimes we use behavior analysis to teach new skills, um, and we do that using reinforcement. And so we've gotten a lot of miles out of this basic kind of ABC uh, type model. Um, we have the experimental functional analysis. That's a big deal. We have functional communication training, also a really big solution to complex problems. And then one area that kind of emerged and piqued my interest is verbal behavior training. So we have uh, assessments such as the VB map, ABLES are, I don't know, there's like over 20 um, that we found when scurrying the literature. Uh, yeah, so there's a, a ton of that out there and we're really good at it. I mean, a COEX, tax, man, society. Um, so we can do it. Uh, arguably, we uh, formed an entire discipline on this idea. So the field of applied behavior analysis is in many ways uh, this. That's cool. Um, and we can call this like stimulus function and, and stimulus functions are at the core of what um, relational frame theory gets at, at least the way that I see it. And so a stimulus function is the relationship between the stimulus and the behavior it evokes that's uh, maintained by its consequences. So the stimulus function, what does the stimulus do? What behavior occurs most readily in the presence of that stimulus? So the first, uh, the first process that we need to understand for relational frame theory is this idea of mutual entailment. And so if you're taught that X is the same as Y, um, you can directly train that, that's great. You will also derive without any sort of explicit instruction that Y is the same as X. And so this is mutual entailment. For you guys who are familiar with symmetry, or sorry, with stimulus equivalence theory, it's called symmetry. So X is the same as Y, derive that Y is the same as X. Um, we can extend the complexity of this network by adding another member, Z, um, or as Americans say, Z. Uh, so Y is less than Z. So not everything is equivalent, right? Not everything is the same, which is why we need a new vernacular. Um, so Y is less than Z, and therefore Z is more then why? And this isn't groundbreaking. I mean, when people are like, oh man, RFT is so complicated. Part of me is like, I don't know why. Of course, if Y is less than Z and Z is therefore more than Y, um, that's cool. And given X is the same as Y and Y is less than Z, we therefore know that Z is more than X and that X is less than Z. And so for you guys who are familiar with like formal philosophy, it's just a syllogism. Um, placed into an account that can be tested. And so we can run basic experiments and hundreds have been conducted showing that um, typically developing humans readily 
do this thing. And if you look at um, this combinatorial entailed X to Z, humans appear to be the only animal capable of making that um, bidirectional relation. And so they've attempted to do it uh, with sea lions, uh, monkeys, pigeons, et cetera. And it seems to be that humans are the only species that readily makes that connection. And so I joke with uh, students who take my classes um, that, I don't know, maybe we have a soul and maybe that makes us unique, but what truly makes us unique is our ability to derive combinatorially entailed relations. Um, that's what makes us human. Um, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of cool. And so, um, but we can't just stop there. We need to focus on what we call a transformation of stimulus function. So if X has a stimulus function, it evokes some sort of behavior that's maintained by reinforcement, positive or negative, um, we can also assume that Y will obtain that function. So you don't actually need any direct experience with Y at all. Um, you don't have to contact Y in the environment um, and get burned. You don't have to contact Y in the environment and contact reinforcement. Y just obtains those functions verbally. You're told that it's the same as X, and so you treat it in that same way. Um, and also, the function transfers to Z. And I changed the color because it's not just simply that the function transfers to Z, but because Z is less than, or sorry, because Z is more than Y, whatever that function is on Y is probably going to be even more pronounced on Z. What's he talking about, Ys and Zs? Okay, let's say that X is a Kit Kat, okay? And Kit Kats are great. So um, we approach the Kit Kat because eating the Kit Kat is maintained by positive reinforcement. It tastes good, it's great. Um, now, so if Y is the same as a Kit Kat, we would expect that you're also going to approach Y. So if somebody tells you that, oh yeah, I tried this candy, it's called a Blip Blap, uh, Blip Blap's like a Kit Kat, then you're gonna be like, sure, I want a Blip Blap. Um, and so you pick up the blip flap when the Kit Kat is absent. Hey, flexibility. Cool. Okay. So that's exciting. And if Z is more than Y and Y is the same as a Kit Kat, then, is, then a Z is better. And so I'm at the store and maybe the Kit Kat's available, but because somebody told me that Z or sorry, Y is less than Z, I derived that Z is more than Y and X. Now I'm going to be like, okay, I want that. And so I'm going to go for Z instead. Um, and that's cool. Um, but we can also get a transformation of aversive or escape functions too. And so here's this big loud barking dog named Henry. Um, or sorry, here's a big loud barking dog and his name is Henry. So why is the name Henry? Now, if I tell you that Henry is less vicious than Frank, oh, by the way, we're going to my friend's house and he had, and Frank lives there. Now I'm freaking out. And so the transfer of the aversive function of the dog is transferred to the name Henry. And now I'm even more afraid of Frank because he told me that Frank is bigger and meaner than Henry. And so I don't actually have to ever meet Frank. I don't need to be attacked by Frank, but I know to avoid Frank um, because of this relational frame. Um, and this applies to any situation. And uh, relational frame theorists like myself argue that we don't, like us as humans who engage in the world verbally, never actually interact with stimuli as they exist in any sort of real way. We're always interacting with our own verbal behavior about the stimuli in front of us. So consider this social event. So here's this person surrounded by other people. How is she feeling? I don't know. But if that situation is the same as Y, you get a transfer of that function. Um, and Z is more than Y. So if social situations are repetitive, if social situations are reinforcing, then this person is going to more readily approach that social situation. They want to be there because Z is even more than those great, awesome social things that they've done before. However, if that person is scared to death of social situations and you're told that this event is going to be even more of a social gathering than where you've been before, that's gonna cause a lot of anxiety. It's gonna cause a lot of escape maintain behavior. And so now the same person is gonna do a lot to escape said. And again, they've never directly experienced that specific event. And so this is a radical movement, um, I, I believe, from a strictly traditional Skinnerian account um, because we're not relying on direct contingencies of reinforcement to explain uh, stimulus uh, functions. Rather, um, we can look at the verbal behavior that participates in it. 
And if you think of how you experience your world verbally, a lot of it's derived. A lot of it wasn't explicitly taught to you. Um, you interact with the world verbally as a unique individual, but it's a very um, dense and multiple history of relational responding. Everything's related to everything. Um, now, this is a really simple example. Life is a lot more than a three-member class, but that kind of basic idea has been the impetus for experiments showing that people do this. Um, but kind of my work and uh, Dr. Dixon and Dr. Caleb Stanley is two of the people who I work most closely with has been to expand the model beyond kind of simple three-member classes to how we relate to things in general. Um, I just really quickly want to tell you guys like three applications in my life and then I'm going to be done with the PowerPoint and we can get into um, answering questions. So the first one is the peak relational training system. And so part, so the first, one of the first areas where we started together was this idea that, well, okay, so if typically developing kids learn these things in the absence of reinforcement, do kids with autism or other disabilities do the same? And some do, and some don't. And so for those who don't, so where this derived relational responding thing is impacted, can we build it like an offer? Can we build it just as we build other verbal behaviors? And if we do, are there any potential um, big outcomes from that. And the outcome research has been pretty, pretty amazing. For example, in a study recently published by uh, Dixon, Palo Lunas and colleagues, a randomized control trial, they showed similar IQ gains uh, as compared to the LOVAS study um, in four hours a week. And for you guys who are familiar with the LOVAS study, that was 40 hours per week. And so by incorporating derived relational response to a training model for human language and cognition, how much of a gain, how much efficiency um, it is introduced by targeting derived relational responding. And so that's been one of our things to kind of uh, dive head deep into that research and understand how this works um, as a training system. Um, the second area that I go into, and again, if you guys have questions about these areas, that's what I would like to dive into. Um, the second one is acceptance and commitment training. And so if we can derive relations, a lot of stuff comes with that. And when you think of the hardest things that you deal with in your life, um, if you could snap your fingers and change something about your life, what you might realize is that a lot of the time it's verbal behavior that participates in that suffering. Verbal behavior being a function of those derived relations, avoiding the party because people are going to be there, um, avoiding fighting with your spouse, even though it might be helpful um, because you relate to that as a bad husband. Um, those verbal relations that show up that cause us to drink heavily to get our minds to shut up um, just for a minute and those types of things. Um, and so how can we uh, change the function of those relations once they show up and they cause us to suffer? And so acceptance and commitment training um, for anyone who's been to ABBA in the last two years has really been a concerted push to evaluate how this can be used by behavior analysts to extend the scope of our services, our practice, um, as well as providing opportunities for you guys to expand the scope of your own practice um, and competence uh, to apply these technologies with the families that you work with. And so my world is doing some of this stuff. Um, we've done it with parents of kids with disabilities to deal with the psychological challenges that come with that. Uh, recently, we've begun to do research with homeless populations in the community um, to work on acceptance, uh, being mindful of the present moment and committing to behavior change to get off the street. Um, and then the final thing is a research interest that really has just come up in the last couple of years for us called relational density theory. And this is uh, evaluating how complex patterns of responding appear to self-organize. Um, and so moving past these three member classes, um, but how do we engage in relating as an entire um, kind of operant? And so can we scale out to a more molar level analysis of derived relational responding? And how does the way that you relate to the world here today affect the way that you relate to things later? The example that I give is if somebody stole you and put you um, on some random purple planet, you would start to make sense of that planet verbally. You don't need anybody reinforcing any relations. You just start to sort and code that information 
in specific ways. So actually nothing is directly reinforced. The relational frames that you show up with appear to exert force or influence on the way that you relate in the future. And so we've conducted a few studies that model that and show that the state structure, the momentary structure of your relational frames at time one dictate how those frames evolve at time two. And so we can track that, um, which is pretty cool. And what's interesting too, is that those relational frames that have a lot of relations that are really tightly bound together um, also appear to be highly resistant to change. And so when you try to alter frames that participate in these strong networks, they don't move um, very much. And right now we're uh, coming up to an election. So you guys can probably um, see that. And so when you show up in an argument with somebody and you have diametrically opposed frames that are very dense and populous, um, it doesn't move. You can provide information and it's weird. It's like whatever you say somehow supports that existing framework, no matter what. So it can be the perfect counter evidence to what they're saying, yet somehow it just strengthens their already deeply held conviction. And so what we've tried to do in relational density theory is to model relational framing in terms of uh, stability and instability um, and other kind of higher order relational learning patterns. So yeah, that's kind of my work in relational frame theory. And Ryan told me that I could put a plug in um, for a book. <laughs> <laughs> for a book that myself, uh, Dr. Stanley and Dr. Dixon um, have been working on. Uh, as you can see, our research on this topic and others is pretty varied. And so what we wanted to do was write a textbook about research methods specifically for behavior analysts. Um, it's going to release in April uh, 2021. What we wanted to do was really take this idea of research across multiple contexts um, and, and uh, explore it with an applied focus. So it's research methods that you would use in your clinic. It's research methods that you would use if you wanted to try to do behavior analysis in a new setting or to try to attenuate a behavior that maybe you haven't dealt with before. Um, it does that by exploring single subject experimental designs, but also group designs that are becoming even more prevalent in the field of behavior analysis. And I think one thing that we're trying to do is to make sure that we talk about how to combine those two things uh, within systems. So if you run an agency and you have 100 kids, how can you use single subject designs and group designs, marry them together, um, and do some pretty deep analyses of the learning that's occurring at your center? Um, there's activities embedded within each chapter, task analyses for how to make graphs um, and how to run the statistics to evaluate them and also an emphasis on how research methods can extend our scope of practice and scope of competence as our field expands. Our field expands concurrently with our research. And so we've try we're trying to provide a tool for behavior analysts to explore greater complexities in the world that we're trying to change.